Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Last couple of weeks we featured guests who've had what you might call multiple conversions. Last week we had a guest who, uh, his journey was from the Baptist Church to the Mormon Church and then to the Catholic Church. And last couple of weeks we've had a number of guests who've had these multiple conversions. Well, we're following in this tradition also tonight. Our guest tonight, Gary Hoag, is a, was on the journey from atheism and then to uh, an evangelical Baptist uh, fire on fire, born again, Christian, and then into the Catholic Church. And so he's here to share his journey with us tonight. And I always remind you that you're an important part of the program as you listen to Gary share his story. If you have any questions, any ideas uh, to help bring out his story or questions you'd like to find out the, of things he went through in his journey that he may not have brought out, then you're important, so give us a call. Uh, if you're in North America, you can give us a call at 1-800-221-9460. We're outside North America. You can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome, one word, at EWTN.com. Gary, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thanks, Marcus. My, my audience probably recognizes that I've shortened the introduction because I always feel like we run out of time, you know, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us on the Journey Home. I, Thank you. It's a pleasure I, to be here. I first found out about you on your internet. Hopefully later we'll have a chance to talk about that because it's a great apologetic site. Thank but you. Uh, every week I invite the guests to begin at the beginning, give us a bit of a summary of, of where you came from spiritually, your, your early spiritual background. Okay. Well, I was baptized when I was about six months old uh, in a <laughs> Methodist church. It meant a lot to you? <laughs> yes, I remember it vividly. <laughs> and uh, I do actually have a vague memory of attending services there uh, when I was fairly young and being bored to death at the time. <laughs> Uh, but my family quit going to church uh, altogether about that time. So really the only religious training I had growing up was my dad reading Bible stories to me and my brother uh, at bedtime. Yeah. And, uh, but, but by the time I was in high school, I think I had pretty much concluded that God was something that people had made up to explain stuff they didn't understand. You know, like, how does the sun go across the sky? I, I don't know. God must pull it. Uh, <laughs> how does it rain? I don't know. God must make it rain. And of course we know that the reason the sun appears to go across the uh, sky is because we're standing on a rotating planet and it rains because of convection and condensation. And it seemed to me that we'd get to a point eventually where we'd figure most things out and we wouldn't need to appeal to God to fill in the gaps. I also noticed that people who were religious had an awful lot of things they couldn't do. They were, see, the belief in God came with a long list of thou shalt nots. <laughs> and there were definitely some things on that list I wanted to do. Uh, so as far as I was concerned by then, uh, I could do whatever I wanted within reason. Mm. And of course, I got to decide what was reasonable. Mm. And that's how I lived my life for, oh, I guess, about the next six years. Uh, until I was Through high school and into college? Through high school and into the first few years when I was in college. Mm. Uh, it was probably the third, maybe the fourth year uh, that I was in college, though. Uh, I started to get really restless and... Um, dissatisfied with everything. Mm. And for a long time I couldn't figure out why. But it just seemed like the more that I did what I wanted, the less I wanted what I did. Mm. I, it, and the more that I had, the more I felt like I needed. Mm. And no matter what I had, and no, no matter how good it was, uh, it just wasn't enough. Mm. I felt like I, I was either missing something really fundamental, or maybe that was as good as life gets and it really wasn't all that great. Mm. It was a kind of a depressing thought. Mm. And I remember uh, vividly one, one day, late winter, sitting in Wendy's having my traditional bowl of chili with cheese, <laughs> and a uh, thought flashed into my head, what about God? You know, like you've tried everything else, uh, what about God? And at any other time I would have laughed at that, but uh, I, I sat and thought about that because I was alone and my friends weren't there. Uh, and I knew that a lot of people said God is what gives their life meaning, God is the center around which everything orbits. and uh, it's in the light of God's existence that everything ultimately makes sense. And I thought, well, I don't know if that's true. I said, I don't believe that's true. But I decided I wanted to find out one way or another whether that was the case. And of course, I knew that if it was, I was going to have to change some things in my life. <laughs> but you know, by then, I didn't care. I'd seen where that kind of freedom takes you. And uh, it seemed to me that being free of the constraints of religion really just meant being free to live a meaningless and ultimately unsatisfying life. And I'd had enough of that. Uh, so fortunately for me, uh, my roommate was a Christian, and I asked if I could go to church with him uh, the next Sunday, see what they know. 
And uh, we went to this little Baptist church outside of town. And uh, the pastor there, God bless him, was the living embodiment of every stereotype I ever had <laughs> of a Southern Baptist preacher. You know, he had the, the three-piece suit and the perfect comb back big hair and, <laughs> and the, the smile that never left, the accent and the Bible that we would wave, you know, when he talked. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? <laughs> but I listened to what he said and, and I liked it. You know, it made sense. And I came back the next Sunday and the Sunday after. And he talked a lot about Jesus and who he was and what he did. And, you know, I don't think he said anything I hadn't heard before. It's kind of hard to miss in America at one point or another. But for the first time, I could see how it applied to me and how it made sense of my life and of the world. And when I thought about that, I was, I was amazed, you know, because here was Jesus, someone I had ignored, ridiculed, offended. And in spite of all that, he's, he's holding out his hand saying, you know what, I know, but come on anyway. I love you anyway. You know, I want you to follow me anyway. And how can you say no to that kind of love? You know? And so I decided that I was going to follow him best I could for the rest of my life. And that was, that was about 18 years ago now. So you pretty much made that initial commitment by yourself. Yeah, uh, I did. I did. And uh, uh, Not at an altar call. I mean, no, oh, no. Usual, you know, no, you I was way too shy to do that. <laughs> you know, people would be looking. You know, I, was, I was home alone at the time. And I, I, I prayed as best I knew how. I said, you know, Lord, I've done a lot of wrong things, and I'm sorry, and uh, I just want to follow you the best way I can, so help me out. And, uh, and he has. And uh, so I graduated from college and took a job in Northern Virginia. Got married to a wonderful woman, Angie. We had a great little boy, Christopher. And we settled into life up there and tried to find a, a church that we liked. Uh, we found many churches we liked. I think by my count we went to about 12 at one time or another. And we liked them all for one reason or another. But uh, it was always something yep. that made us want to move to the next one. We were in an area where there were a million churches, though, so we didn't feel like we were, you know, had, we had a pretty low threshold of, of wanting to move on to the next one. I asked, uh, I made that quip at the beginning of the program about your baptism. And the point being, later when so you had your sacramental baptism yes. as a child, but yes. later when you went through your conversion, deep conversion, did that initial baptism mean anything to you at that point? At that point, no, because in a Baptist theology, you know, they believe in you know, adult-only believer. well, not necessarily, but believers-only baptism. Right. And uh, so I felt like, well, I need to be baptized. That didn't count. I had no say in it. Uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, one of my wife's best friends, her husband is a Methodist minister. We went down to visit them. Uh, where they had a church in uh, uh, Port Republic, Virginia, which is right on the Shenandoah River. So he took me down into the, into the Shenandoah River and uh, baptized me there. <laughs> and the reason I mention that, because a lot of our viewers probably have been through that kind of experience. They're brought up in a more traditional experience, had traditional baptism, later have a big born again reconversion, and then get rebaptized. And maybe right. we can bring that up again. Another issue that, uh, as you were talking, um, you're you and I both have heard many conversions of people who've gone through a similar thing where way apart from God they feel there's something missing and it, 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 you hear that a lot mm -hmm. it almost sound sounds canned when you hear people say it but what I find as I think about it, it does this confirm what you is that what the reason there's this need for something more is because when you look square on with the real implications of where you were headed nobody really wants that that's right, because God is love. And so what is, you know, you don't have God, all you have is maybe a pale reflection of love that you find in the world. And that's not going to satisfy you for very long. Yeah, and you were getting drawn more into the science explanation of everything, which ultimately means we're no more important and significant than this table here. I that's mean, right. That would be what it is. And so ultimately, God is going to use that to give a hunger for really what we were intended to experience. And one other thing before we go on, and that is that uh, in our early conversation, it might be good, you mentioned a few uh, names of people uh, in the, the, the more evangelical world that at least by m naming them, some of our audience may be able to pigeonhole where you were theologically sure. at that point in your journey. Oh, sure. As soon as I uh, committed myself to the Lord, I, I wanted to learn everything I could about the faith, so I hit the bookstore. and. Uh, 
I became very interested in apologetics. I really wanted to be able to defend the faith, explain to especially the atheists like myself that it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, most of them, I think, probably use reason as an excuse more than mm -hmm. a reason. But uh, still, it's, it's useful to be able to do that. I read uh, books like Paul Little's uh, Know Why You Believe, yeah. um, Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, D. James Kennedy, uh, yeah. Why I Believe, Truth That Transform. So all of come the evangelical camp, intervarsity camp, sure. Presbyterian, Presbyterian, Calvinist, uh, right. Baptist slash Baptist evangelical. So that whole. Now you did mention though that you were in a town of a bazillion churches. Yes. Had you also got caught up, would you say, in a little bit of that modern indifferentism? That really it's really you and Jesus, and that these churches are kind of secondary. Oh yeah. Uh, in, in our theology, the church itself wasn't all that important. It was just a. a group of like-minded people. And you know, the idea was you could come together, worship together, reinforce each other, encourage each other, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, Wherever two or more gathered in my name. Exactly. I mean, exactly. You literally could go home and start your own little church and be as valid as any other. Exactly, you could. And that's why one reason we you know, didn't mind going to this one or that one or the next one. And if we found something we didn't like at this one, no problem, there's one down the street we could go to. Could you put your finger out the time, what you were looking for? You're just... Uh... It's, it's hard to say. Uh, probably perfection. <laughs> it All doesn't right. really exist. Uh, All right. But there All right. also, uh, because the theology is always just a little bit different, even even within the evangelical yeah. churches, they're very similar. But right. there's always some difference, and sooner or later I'd run into something I thought was weird, and you know, that's not right. You know, I mean, we find another church that doesn't teach that. <laughs> I've been on that journey, I, and I'm sure some of those watching. Well, then what opened your heart and mind to the Catholic Church? At what point did you and your wife both get zapped, or at least start thinking about the Catholic Church? Well. I, I, I never thought the Catholic Church was evil the way some Protestants do. I, mean, I thought it was wrong about a lot of things, and I kind of felt sorry for Catholics, actually. I thought, well, you know, here's this, this simple message that Jesus gave us, and they've buried it under 2,000 years of ritual and tradition. Yeah. Uh, but one day, somebody at my office gave me a copy of Carl Keating's book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the, I read the back cover, and I, uh, I thought, well, this is amazing. I, I was impressed that someone had the guts to try to defend Catholicism, of all things, from the Bible. And I just, I had to read this. I had to see just what he was going to say. And, and so I did. And uh, if you've read it, Keating is a yeah, great yeah, writer. Yeah, that book was key to my own journey. It's a great book. It really is. He's a, he's a gentle writer, too, which really helps disarm you when you're reading it. And that book had a big impact on me. It did a couple of things. One is that it showed me that I really didn't understand the Catholic faith like yeah. I thought I did. Because when he explained it, it seemed pretty reasonable and it counteracted some of the misconceptions that I had. Uh, and it also, in a gentle way, pointed out some of the shortcomings of my own approach to Christianity that I had never thought about. Uh, for instance, uh, well, we have a rock bottom uh, theology there that, that uh, the Bible is our only source of doctrine and practice. That, uh, you know, in other words, if it's not in the Bible, it's not part of the Christian faith. And Keating points out, well, where's that in the Bible? Mm. It's yeah. not there. You know, I couldn't find that anywhere. And that, that was kind of surprising to me. Was it at this point, um, I remember um, your discovery that, in fact, the Catholic Church often took the scriptures more literal than Protestants. Had you discovered that at this stage or that later yet? Well, I think I, think I first, first noticed that because I think he pointed it out in yeah. his book. And I thought that was an irony. And, and that actually was true, and I didn't realize how many passages in Scripture, especially when it talks about things like, like baptism, you know, being, being uh, regenerated in baptism, uh, how we kind of glossed over that or, or took it very figuratively. When it, if you look at it in, in, in the light of Catholic, it's just not yeah. uh, very figurative at all. Yeah, you had mentioned, uh, in, in actually it was your, your conversion story that, that I read recently, which I, I highly recommend to folk, that, um, that for example, the scripture about being born again by water and the Spirit. Right. Very clearly talking about water, but as Protestants, we kind of symbolize, mysticize that. Uh, right. It yeah. represents something else. Yeah. And of course, obviously, with uh, the John six passages about the Eucharist. Y yes, exactly. Uh, and those, when you when you read them, they're obviously very literal, and it, his his audience certainly thought so, and he didn't correct them. So here you read Carl Keating as a good Baptist. Uh, what did you do with it? Throw it across the room? Or did it, <laughs> did it uh, really open your eyes to the Catholic Church? Or what did it do? It certainly started me in that direction. Uh, when I, by the time I'd finished reading it, I, I, I thought, first of all, that I hadn't understood it very well, that there were problems in my own approach to Christianity, but also the vision of, of the Catholic Church that he sketched out, 
I had to admit was attractive. Mm -hmm. The idea of this, of the Church of Jesus Christ being this worldwide family, really, of people that, that prayed in common, worshiped in common, you know, the same Pope. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was impressive, and it kind of, it seemed to me maybe that's the way the Church of Jesus Christ, who is impressive, ought to be. <laughs> uh, but from there, I decided to branch out, read some more things, see if I could learn some you more. You didn't join the next weekend. No, I, no, no, <laughs> not, not right away. Uh, I, I did, I put my hands on every Catholic book I could find. I read the Catechism. That was a big help. Mm -hmm. uh, very big book, but worth yeah. reading. Um, Mark Shea's book, By What Authority, was mm -hmm. a very, very big help book. for me. What's that about? That book? Oh, in that one, he, he looks at the Bible and tradition and shows uh, how, in fact, tradition is a valid source of revelation. And not only that, but that as Protestants, we already accept a good deal of tradition without even knowing it. That was a big surprise to me, but I had to admit he was right. By the time I got finished with the book, it seemed kind of obvious. Uh, for instance, when I opened my New Testament, it's got 27 books in it. Who put them there? How'd they get there? Who decided this book and not that book? That's was the result of about 300 years of discernment by Christians before it finally crystallized. That's a tradition. Uh, if I read the book of Luke, how do I know Luke wrote that? It doesn't say. But so, I mean, it says in my Bible, but the original doesn't say. <laughs> Again, tradition. Why do I accept a book of Scripture that was written by someone like Luke, who I know never met Jesus and wasn't an apostle? Again, tradition. How do I know that monogamy is the only acceptable form of Christian marriage? It doesn't say that in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, the Old Testament seems to imply, at least, that polygamy is okay. Mm -hmm. But I know as a Christian, it isn't, and again, by tradition. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that, that the difference between me and Catholics was not that they accept tradition and I don't. It's that they accept tradition and they know they do. And I did too, but I didn't know it. <laughs> or at least would deny it. I would <laughs> certainly deny it. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened then? You, you read a couple more books and... Uh, how long did it take you to start really getting open to the possibility? Was it a scary thing or what? At first, yeah. At first it was because it's so different. Yeah. Um, a few different dogma. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a whole different approach, really. I mean, the, the whole Catholic way of doing things is a bit different. Uh, it's a, so also a cultural aspect of it. Right. Catholic piety is very different than evangelical piety. But uh, it took me several months of reading uh, to get where I thought, you know, this is probably true. And one thing that, that uh, had a big impact on me, too, was reading the writings of some of the earliest Christians. Uh, yeah. Of course, I knew there were Christians in the first, second, third, fourth century, but I had no idea that some of them had left writings that we could read. And we could see in their own words, in their own description, what they said their faith was like. Now, if you'd asked me, I would have said, well, it probably is going to look like my evangelical, quasi-Baptist faith. But when I read it, uh, I read, for instance, Ignatius of Antioch, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. Hard to get much closer to the source than that. And he's, in every one of his letters, is talking about how important it is to be obedient to the bishop, how important it is for the priests mm -hmm. to uh, obey the bishop, and how the whole local church centers around the bishop. Uh, I don't have a bishop, or priests for that matter. Uh -huh. He's describing the Eucharist as being really the body and blood of Christ, and how the heretics deny that and perish in their errors. And I'm thinking, wow, I, don't, I didn't believe that. And, and as I read all, um, him and, and others, the faith that they described as their own uh, seemed an awful lot much more like the Catholic faith than it did as my, uh, as my Baptist faith. And I thought, I, I know that some people see that and they think, well, I know the Christian church went off the rails pretty early, but gosh, I had no idea it was you know, after 100 years. Yeah. And that didn't make any sense to me, uh, just, just from a human standpoint. If you have people who go and they spread a message uh, all over their known world, they live with these people for months. They teach them what to believe, how to worship, you know, whom to baptize, things like that, and then move on. The idea that they could all, all over the world, uh, fall into error and fall into exactly the same error uh, didn't make much sense to me, especially when you factor in the fact that this is the Church of Jesus Christ we're talking about. And Jesus, who is God, certainly ought to be able to come up yeah. with a way to spread his message that's not going to fall on its face in the first hundred years. Yeah. Yeah, of course he promised it wouldn't. Exactly. Know, so. That's right. That was another. That was a verse that really stood out to me. You know, Matthew uh, sixteen eighteen, where a lot of people focus on the first part, where he says, "You are Peter, and on this rock." But he says, "I will build my church. I will build my church. Yeah. Not you. I." And he's going to build it through the apostles. He's going to build it through the people that they teach. But what we see in the early centuries is him building his church, because mm. that's what he said he would do. You had mentioned at one point that uh, you had, when you first discovered Jesus 
and had that reawakening in your life. That the first thing you did was not only go out and read books, but you read some apologetic books. At this phase, did you read any books, you know, apologetic for the church, apologetic against the church? I tried to. I, I, I looked all over the internet because that's such a great source for yeah. things. I wanted to find the best Protestant arguments I could find against the Catholic faith now that I felt I understood it pretty well, especially having read the Catechism. And the thing I kept finding over and over again was I found lots of Protestant arguments, but they were almost always straw man arguments. They were always attacking something that really wasn't a good representation of the Catholic faith. And so I, I must say I was kind of disappointed that I uh, wasn't able to find a very good uh, in other words, they would, they would say the Catholics worship Mary, and then they would do a bunch of biblical verses to prove that we aren't supposed to worship Mary. Exactly. When in reality, the Catholic Church doesn't worship Mary. You know? Exactly. I already knew we weren't supposed to worship Mary. Okay. All right. So it was probably Catholic. Carl Keating's book that kind of keyed you off on some of those bad arguments that were coming from the other side. Yes. What was the final straw? Hmm. It's hard to point to any one particular thing as the final straw. Uh, I, I picture it more as like getting rolling down a hill and just, I mean, I got to the point where I said, all right, if I want to continue to be a faithful follower of Jesus, I really ought to be in the church he made. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see any good reason not to be. And I think that's an important thing, too, is that the Catholic Church obviously was there first. Yeah. Uh, the Protestants left the church uh, th because they said it was wrong. They said it had corrupted some things, and they were going to fix that. So the burden of proof is on them. Yeah. Uh, just because I was a Protestant doesn't change that. Yeah. Uh, so I thought uh, I needed to see if they had made their case, and I did not think they did. And so uh, it seemed to me clear then that I should be Catholic. Well, once you came into the church, you got this website started. That's how I first discovered about your work. Tell us about how that thing started. <laughs> that started actually while I was still a Protestant. Okay. Uh, as I was trying to answer the Protestant arguments against the Catholic faith, I'd write them down. Because uh, I figured if I could explain it to somebody else or even to myself in writing, then I'd know I understood it. And eventually I, you know, I had this big storehouse of them on my computer, and I thought maybe other people might like to see them. So I created this website. I originally called it A Protestant's Guide to the Catholic Church because that's what I thought it would be. I thought, you know, I would explain to Protestants, you know, what the Catholic Church was all about. Uh, but actually, over the years, I think I've gotten more feedback from Catholics who've said, I didn't understand my own faith very well. Thanks for, you know, helping me understand it. So uh, I changed the name to Catholic Outlook. Okay. CatholicOutlook.com. Catholic Outlook all right. And what would people find if they went to your website? Well, the heart of it is still uh, answers to common objections. Okay. I mean, dozens and dozens of, of things you're going to hear all the time from people. Uh, why do you do this or that? Why do you believe this or that? And my best shot at answering that. Uh -huh. And I've added a few other things, uh, dialogues I've had with Protestants. Some of them have been really good. I've met some really intelligent uh, Protestants out there, almost universally friendly people, good people, good Christians that I've really enjoyed talking to. Uh, and I hope that comes through in the dialogues. <laughs> but I think when you read the give and take between people, you know, real live people, uh, I think it really helps you to flesh out the arguments yourself. All right. Well, thanks, Gary. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with more of your questions for Gary Hogue. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Our guest, Gary Hogue, has done a fine job of summarizing his lifelong journey from uh, atheism into the Baptist Church and then the Catholic Church. I mean, you, you can only hit the high points. It's hard to get all the issues, but hopefully some of the emails, phone calls will be able to bring up more of, of the issues of your journey. Let's go first with our first caller, Judy from Connecticut. Hello, Judy. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, yes, hello. I have a question about multiple conversions yeah. and the feeling of guilt. Um, I was raised a Protestant, and after not getting very good answers over the um, creation in the Trinity, I found my way to the Jewish religion, and I converted to Judaism. Yeah. Unbeknownst to me, a number of years later, I, um, I had a redemption in Christ, mm -hmm. and I've been studying Catholicism for two years. Yeah. However, um, I have a tremendous feeling of guilt over breaking the covenant, as well as a fear that if I convert to Catholicism, will I be able to keep that commitment? And I was wondering if you had those same types of feelings. 
Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for yeah, that a, uh, candid question. expression of your own journey, and our prayers are with you. Yes, absolutely. That, that's a real good question. I think in my case, uh, I, don't f I never did feel guilt for it because as I moved from, uh, say, the Baptist faith to the Catholic faith, uh, I've always felt that I took the best of the Baptist faith with me, uh, that, that uh, much of it is true, most of it is true. And I, I felt that, that by being Catholic, I've just sort of, in a sense, completed that. Mm. So I don't feel like I've repudiated it. And I, I think that the same thing might be true of, of moving from Judaism to Christianity, because certainly Judaism, uh, as far as it goes, is true. You yeah. know, that is the only other religion besides Christianity that really is based on divine revelation. So it's not, I think, necessary to, to repudiate that. Uh, rather, you can bring the best of it with you. In fact, I would, we've had a number of Jewish converts on this program, and Judy, I would strongly encourage you to maybe get in contact with uh, either Rosalind or Dave, uh, her brother Dave Moss. And uh, Rosalind, both of Rosalind and David have been on the EWTN uh, many times. Rosalind worked for Catholic Answers. The reason I say they're both Jewish converts, and both of them remind us that to be good Catholics, we have to recognize that at the core we're good Jews. Yeah. I mean, that's what we really are as good Catholics and uh, fulfilled Jews, if you would put it. And so I encourage you to get in contact with either uh, Rosalind or David Moss and their work. It would be a good encouragement uh, to you on your journey. Let's take this uh, next email. This is from Paul G. of Colorado. Dear Mr. Hogue, I am curious to hear more of your journey about coming to love and honoring our blessed Mother Mary perpetual virginity, assumption, etc. All good Baptist theologies, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, blessing upon you and your show. Thank you, Paul. They weren't exactly Baptist theologies. Were they, uh, how were they in your journey, your <laughs> accepting of Marian? Well, I think, uh, like a lot of people, I had a lot of problems with some of those doctrines, but more so some than others. There were some, like uh, the assumption, I didn't really have much of a problem with. But there were biblical instances where that happened to people, so you know, why not her? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, but, you know, I think, actually, my wife, has been a really big help to me in that respect because she developed a great devotion to Mary. And, and I could see the, the wonderful effect that yeah. had on her. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, as I realized that, that the, the Mary's whole purpose is to draw us closer to Jesus, you know, the, the, to point the way to Him more, that by loving her you know, mm. is a way to draw closer to Him, that really helped me uh, to overcome some of the uh, squeamishness, I guess, that I felt at first. That's actually a good point because we don't often mention this, but I mean the measure of whether devotion to Mary over all these centuries is valid is, as Jesus said, is by their fruit you will know them. Exactly. I mean, look at the holy folk uh, saints from every culture who've had very balanced and faithful devotions to Mary, uh, and we see the results of their lives. And I mean, the key for Protestant listeners is that those who have a deep, sincere devotion to Mary have a deep, sincere devotion. That's Jesus, right. and a I, commitment and a love of Christ. Right, and I think when, when you're a Protestant, we tended to look at it as sort of a, a trade-off. If you loved Mary more, you had to love Jesus less. And that's not true. You can, by loving her, actually end up loving him more, exactly. which is amazing. Very good. Let's take our next caller, Lauren from Massachusetts. Hello, Lauren, what's your question? Hi, I love your program. Thank you. um, question is, I'm coming into Catholicism from the Baptist Church. Ah, welcome home. <laughs> My problem is, um, I believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist, the way the Catholics do, and that's very important to me. Yeah. My problem in leaving is um, the community is so in the Baptist Church is so loving and supportive, and I feel guilty about this because it should be more important about Jesus being in the Eucharist. Can you help me out with this? Thank you, Lauren, for your question. Well, actually, her, she's got two prongs to her question, because on the one hand, it is often for converts one of the difficult things to do is to break that community connections you always had. But her was more of an inner concern, right? Yeah. You know, her commitment to the community rather than the Eucharist. Right, and, and sometimes you have to make the unfortunate choice, and uh, that's, that's never easy. For me, I was lucky. Uh, most of the, I guess all the Protestant friends that I've had have stuck with me, and, and yeah. I was able to sort of stay with that community. Um, and maybe that'll be the case with you. If you know, hopefully your good friends will, will be understanding and supportive. Um, and hopefully also you'll, you'll be uh, leaving one Christian community and coming to an even larger one where uh, you'll find, I hope, a very good sense of community. Yeah. Part of it is, 
you might say comparing apples and oranges because the Catholic community is focused around the unity of the Eucharist and often the other communities are focused around the unity of the, the sermon or the unity of the fellowship or the union of, of the outreach. The focus is different. That's true. So, so the tenor of the community might seem different. Especially at first. Yeah. I, I can remember uh, going to Catholic churches at first and thinking that people seemed kind of cold because you'd go into Mass and nobody would talk to you. And, you know, it's like you know, they were all focused on, on worship. And it, I always used yeah. to, you come in, you say hi, you chat a while, and then, then you get started. Yeah. Uh, in the Catholic Church, we do our chatting in the lobby afterwards. Yeah, because there is the recognition of Christ's presence exactly. truly there in the Eucharist. Let's take our uh, next email. Kathy from Northern Virginia writes, Dear Marcus and Gary, could you please recommend resources that would help secularists, probably atheists or agnostics, to consider the Catholic faith? Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Kathy, for your email. Hmm. That's a real good question. Um, I think... Uh, for most, uh, I shouldn't say most, for a lot of atheists, and uh, for myself, uh, reason is secondary. It's, it's, it's an excuse. It sort of gives an intellectual cover for a decision that is really a moral one. You need to make sure, uh, if you have a specific person in mind, whether that's the case, because if it is, then all the reasons in the world are really not going to help. Mm -hmm. And they may, need some, uh, they may need to come to the point in their life where I did, where you realize that this is just not the way to go because then you can easily overcome arguments. If it's a person who really is convinced uh, down to their bones that uh, it's just not true, uh, there, are, there are a number of good, uh, yeah. uh, good Christian apologetics works out there. Um, I can't think of the titles. Well, the one you mentioned earlier, which is a Protestant writer, uh, Josh McDowell, um, I don't recommend Sadly, he, you know, falls sway to many Protestant arguments when right. it comes to the issue of the church. But his base roots issue on just basic Christian apologetics about did Jesus really resurrect from the dead, some of those basic issues are still pretty solid. Right. So, so that part of his book, uh, maybe the early parts of Evidence that Demands a Verdict can be good. Um, of course, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity is also another one that's uh, fairly good at a basic level. Do you right. have other ideas? I think, I think Peter Kreef wrote one. I think it was called uh, Handbook of Christian Apologetics. Yeah, yeah. That's an excellent resource. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that book he did with a Protestant writer. And so it's very, uh, it's not a polemical issue, but, I'm, right. but yet he doesn't compromise either in his side of the argument when it comes to the church. So, yes, I would strongly recommend that book. Yeah. Uh, and maybe other ones will come up to us, but in a certain sense, any of Peter Kraft's books are excellent. Yes, they are. Because he is a, a professor of philosophy and is always confronted with that issue of atheism. And so I know it, that's an issue that's always uh, important to him. So maybe that'll help our, our, our viewers. Let's check our next caller, Jody from Nebraska. Yes. Hello. What's your question? Hi. Uh, my question is, since the Protestants really don't believe in purgatory, how did he deal with that issue? All right. Thank you, Jody. Oh, well, that was one of <laughs> that was one of many uh, one of many issues, but actually, that was an area where my Protestant theology kind of helped push me into it, because see, we we believed the idea that we were not perfected in this life, that that Jesus uh, didn't so much take away our sins as cover them over, so that when God would look at us, He would see the merits of Christ and not our sin. But I also knew from the Bible that uh, as far as going into heaven, nothing imperfect can enter it. It specifically says that. So I knew that there had to be, at some point between when I'm alive and sinful and, and in heaven and not, that somehow I had to be renewed and cleansed. Now I know some of that takes place here in life, and we call it sanctification. But I didn't expect to hit perfection in this life. Uh, and so I imagined that at the point of death, there must be some sort of instant cleansing. And uh, that's basically purgatory. Yeah. And I realized then that really I already believed in purgatory. I just didn't call it that. And I never really thought about whether it, uh, it's a drawn out process or a quick process. Um, but I really already found I believed in it. Yeah. Which is really uh, at the core, it's, it's how one understands what sin does to you. Right. And forgiveness, what it accomplishes, which is different between the Baptist and the Catholic right, we saw it mostly as a as a, just a judicial thing. God declares that I'm righteous. I'm not, but He's going to pretend sort of that I am for Christ's sake. That's the Baptist view. Exactly. Right, right. And, and and if you have that view, then 
it seems to me that it becomes all the more necessary that there's some sort of cleansing at some point because that's not going to cut it in heaven. Yeah. At that point, you really need to be pure. You really need to be clean. And in fact, as Catholics, we also believe in the judicial view. But right. there's, a, there's, there's a bigger picture than just that one single way of understanding uh, our sanctification, justification and sanctification. Right. All right, let's go with our next email. Francis from Illinois. Uh, God, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Marcus, did your guest ever look to the Eastern Christian churches on its discovery of truth? God bless your ministry. ministry. Did the uh, Eastern rites at all come into sway in your journey? Um, not, not Orthodoxy or Eastern? Right? Yeah, not so much. Uh, although I think since then, right. since I've become Catholic, uh, I've looked into the, some of the Eastern rites a bit, and I've, I've wanted to uh, actually uh, attend a, an Eastern rite uh, divine liturgy. I haven't yet, but uh, I hear it's really beautiful. Uh, but I, I, it seemed to me that the big difference between Eastern Orthodoxy, when I was considering Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism was the papacy. And that was something that made a lot of sense to me, that, 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 that we kind of needed a pope. So I wasn't attracted to the idea of not having one. I already didn't have one. <laughs> And also, I, I realize that between Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they sometimes see each other as, as different and have this huge gulf between them. But from where I was coming, from you know, being a Baptist, <laughs> they were practically identical as far as I was concerned. Except down to basically Except the, for issue that one of, issue. Of the authority of the, of the bishop. Of exactly. Rome. Let's take our next caller, Pamela, New Jersey. What's your question for us tonight? Thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. um, your guest mentioned that there is a difference between evangelical and Catholic piety, and I was wondering if he could elaborate on that. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, good question. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think in the uh, evangelical uh, piety, our worship tends to be um, tended to be more of an intellectual thing, uh, thinking right thoughts about God. Uh, we'd worship Him with our mind. We'd worship Him. You know, in song, that sort of thing. Uh, Catholic piety is much more visual. It's much more tactile. We've got rosary beads and things. We've got statues. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a different approach that uh, incorporates the, the physical world in a, in much more so uh, than evangelical piety does. Not that they don't okay. somewhat, but much more so in the Catholic faith. In fact, uh, make, just to make a little, uh, make sure there's not a misunderstanding there, it isn't the one versus the other right. because within Catholicism, of course, you have that. Maybe we ought to sing a little louder on, on, <laughs> on any given Sunday, but uh, you know, we have the great hymns of the Catholic faith. We have great right. singing. We have uh, obviously a great intellectual content, but it's a recognition of the whole person, exactly. the physical aspect, not merely the spiritual. Exactly. In fact, would you say it in a certain sense that sometimes our separated brethren almost are Gnostics in the separation from the spiritual realm and then the physical realm. Absolutely, without meaning to be. Uh, right. they, they tend to see anything physical as, a, as getting in the way, mm -hmm. something that would trip you up, something that would keep you from Jesus who is spiritual, uh, that, that uh, any sort of uh, icon, say, anything that, that's, that's physical would get in your way and impede yeah. your relationship with Jesus. Uh, and I've found being Catholic that that's not true. It's actually a, a great help. Uh, and yeah, earlier I didn't mean to imply that I was trading one piety right. for another, rather adding one yeah. to what I already did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, in history, the church has always used that idea of grace building on nature. Right. Uh, so the missionaries would go into some culture and they would use physical aspects of, of their traditions and culture and then build on that and, and see the meaning in that as opposed to this juxtaposition of what was to. Uh, uh, to again, the division between the, the deeper spiritual and the physical, and I, I love that as a part of our Catholic faith. I it took a too. while to completely understand it in my own spiritual journey. Um, when you've been a Protestant for many, many years, it takes a while to, to loosen up, but uh, I do now see what... Actually, the, the gospel was preached for so many years through physical things when people couldn't read. That's right. And there's so much of it in the New Testament, too. You know, Jesus made mud and put on somebody's eyes yeah. it, it told them, go wash in water. And all, you know, all these things, uh, uh, handkerchiefs that the apostle had touched and were yep. taken to the sick and would heal them. Yep. You know, very Catholic sounding stuff. Let's take our next email from Rashad in Florida. Dear Mr. Hogue, in my own conversion, I have found that I have had trouble coming to deal with the deuterocanonical books. How did you come to accept these books in your own conversion? Thank you, Rashad. That's a great question. Uh, I was actually one of the 
one of the first things that... Explain to some people what he's talking about. Ah, uh, <laughs> the, the deuterocanonical books, uh, books Protestants called the Apocrypha. Uh, seven books that uh, Protestants objected to at the time of the Reformation. So these do not belong in the Bible, and they didn't print them in their Bibles. Uh, and then you won't find them in Protestant Bibles today. You will find them in Catholic Bibles. Uh, what I found out when I went from looking back in the church history is that the very same church councils back in the fourth century that gave us the New Testament in its current form also listed the books of their Old Testament and they always included those books. They always included the books that Catholics called the deuterocanonical books. So it wasn't until the time of the Reformation uh, that they were removed from the Bible. So what we as, as Protestants, I found, actually had the story backward. We'd been taught that Catholics added these books after the Reformation in order to justify some of their doctrines when the truth was that the Protestants had removed them, I had perhaps to justify some of theirs. <laughs> or maybe because some of the theology that was in some of those books. You know, one book that just always strikes me as interesting, the book called Ecclesiasticus, yeah. is the book of the church. That's what the word means. Yes. You know, it's one of those wonderful books that was quoted very often in the early days of the church. And one of them, Wisdom Chapter 2, if you look at that, has a, a description of the death of the righteous man read that. If that's not a prophecy uh, of Jesus Christ written a couple hundred years before he came, then there aren't any. All right. Um, we have an email from John Fernandez, and he writes, can you be a Catholic and not totally believe the dogma of the Immaculate Conception or the dogma of the Assumption? Thank you, John, for putting our guest on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you want to make sure you understand the difference between believe and understand. You might never fully understand it. You might not see how it makes sense even. Or, under, or you might say, well, I wouldn't have come to that conclusion. But a, a large part of being Catholic is to recognize that the Christian faith, the Catholic faith, has existed long before we were born. And it will go on long after we're dead. Uh, it's not something we decide what it is. It is what it is, and we accept it, or we don't. And uh, we realize as Catholics that Jesus gave his church the authority to teach in his name. And so we accept his teaching as coming from him. And we may say, I still don't get it. I would never have come to that conclusion myself. But if this comes from Jesus, then we ought to accept yeah, it. Yeah, that's a really good point. I remember when I struggled with issues like that, when myself I didn't completely understand or struggled with, what, what helped me understand it was the reason that we believe it is not because the church says it's true. But the church says it's true because it's true. Right. And there's a big difference there, a philosophical, a, a grounding level. And so the reason we trust that it's true because the church says it's true is because the spirit guides the church. And so therefore, I may not understand the Immaculate Conception or maybe because of my background. It's, it, but I trust the church is being guided to point to what is true. And so therefore, we trust it. Doesn't mean we have to quit thinking. Right. No, 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 no. I mean, that's exactly what Catholic schools and, and uh, uh, graduate programs and philosophical classes are all about, is continuing to think, but uh, we're guided in our thinking. All right, I think we have another caller. Yes, Stacy from Connecticut. Hello, Stacy. What's your question for us? Hi. Um, I was wondering how you came to deal with the issue of the authority of the church and about how in a number of issues it seems like the church does your thinking for you and you are invited to either assent or leave. All right, thank you very much. Well, that just kind of jumps right on what we were yeah. talking about. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't know if I'd put it quite that bluntly. Yeah, well, well, that's all right. <laughs> sure, that's, that's fine. Another, side of, another way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as far as the authority of the church, uh, one of the things that I mentioned before is that I had read a lot of the early Christian writings, and they put a lot of emphasis on the authority of the church. Uh, not only that, but the Bible does too. Jesus said, you know, if you won't listen to the church, then treat him as you would a, a heathen. Uh, and, and if you have a problem, take it to the church. Um, also, the Apostle Paul wrote, you know, obey your leaders uh, who have watch over you. Uh, and as far as, as doing your thinking for you, I, I don't know if I'd put it quite that way, but I don't know if we, if we stop and think about it just how how few things we think of originally ourselves. <laughs> uh, all of science, you know, uh, for instance, uh, some, someone else discovered, and we just pretty much accept it. We read you know, How many of us believe in the theory of relativity because Einstein said it was true, right. but not a one of us really understands 
what E equals MC squared means. Exactly. We can't we, touch it and feel it or see it. We take a lot of things on faith and a lot of things on authority from merely human sources, much, probably much more so than we think about. Um, and I, I suppose as a Protestant as well, you know, if the Bible says it, it's true. And also as a Catholic, I believe that still. If the Bible says it, it's true. And, and the reason that I can accept what the church says is because I know that the church is teaching in Jesus' name with his authority, and I believe that he can't lie. And as long as I believe that, then I can accept what the church is teaching in his name. Would you say, would you go so far as to say that often the reason people don't like to follow certain things of the church, challenge the authority, because the things that the church wants them to believe are things that are limiting their freedom? Uh, that's probably often the case. I, I don't want to generalize, <laughs> but... Uh, I think that's that's. We're often. not pointing this at our last caller by Absolutely any means, but not. I'm just talking about in general that sometimes that. I think that's really probably true for all of us. The things that we really struggle with, you know, are things that hit kind of close to home. You know, it's okay to believe something that doesn't really impact on me. Uh, it becomes much harder when it does. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, your your website has brought you into a lot of debates with folk. Are there face-to-face -face debates or mainly paper-to-paper -paper debates? Uh, always paper-to-paper. -paper. <laughs> I send them something, they read it, they reply, I reply to them, and then I cut and paste it all together in a nice little back-and-forth format. All right, and then they're available on your website if people want to... Yeah. In fact, I have a special page of dialogues that you can go to and see uh, me dialoguing with uh, various other Christians. All right. Again, that's catholicoutlook.com, in case any of you are interested. In in fact, some of you might have some of the questions that weren't answered tonight. You'd like to pose them. Well, you can keep him busy on his website. <laughs> uh, he's there uh, available, uh, as the Lord wills, uh, to answer your questions. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go take a break, one last break, and then we'll come back for uh, some final words for the journey home. See you in a bit. Welcome back. There's an email that uh, I was notified of during the break that, uh, let me apologize for doing a bit of an infomercial here. Uh, Eric from Indiana was wondering if I would mention, at least uh, uh, give a heads up to the Coming Home Network conference we're having this coming November. And uh, it really is built on the idea, as our guest tonight has mentioned, the importance of the early fathers, the early church in uh, bringing people to the Catholic faith. Our conference this fall, which is in Columbus, Ohio, in the first weekend of November, is a Deep in History conference. All of our Coming Home Network conferences focus on how becoming deep in history uh, strengthens our faith in Christ. And our theme this fall is on the early church fathers. So if you're interested in finding out more about the Coming Home Network conference in Columbus in November, go to our website, chnetwork.org. You can find out about the speakers and about the topics. All right. Uh, I usually ask this question as a way of kind of bringing it all to a close. Uh, Gary, how has becoming a Catholic strengthened your faith in Christ? That is a good question. And there are so many ways. But I think it goes back to, if I was going to pick one, uh, it's something we mentioned before is the physicality of the faith. The fact that it, that it gives me tools to worship God with my whole being, uh, not just my mind, mm -hmm. uh, but also my whole body. Uh, for instance, something as simple as uh, making the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's almost the whole gospel in one move. You know, you've got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, yeah. uh, the Trinity. You've, we are making the sign of the cross, which represents our salvation. You know, if you think about what you're doing, yeah. it's a very reverent thing. I can go to any Catholic church, and I can go into the presence, the actual physical presence of Jesus Himself, which is to me an amazing thing. Yeah. And, it's draw, uh, that's, uh, and also, especially at Mass, I can, I can actually receive His body into my body. I mean, you can't get much closer than that. Huh. Yes, yeah, sadly, this issue of the blessing in the, it was very real in the scriptures. Old and New Testament, the concept of a physical blessing yes. that conveyed the grace of God. And we kind of lost that when we were not Catholics. But that's the beauty of the, uh, of the physicality of the blessing. It's not a magical issue. No. But it's, it's an opening and a recognition of God's work of grace using his physical word as channels, as channels of his grace. 
Carrie, thank you very much for joining us on the journey home. God thank bless you. you and your work, and also your your avocation there on the on your website. And uh, I really hope that that our program tonight brings you, uh, you know, what, what's it called? Just jams up your server <laughs> with questions of folk. And, uh, My provider will really appreciate that. Yes. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us on the journey home. Every week, I have this great privilege of. Uh, helping our guests tell their story. And I hope you realize from one week to the next that as one of our callers wondered tonight about the multiple conversions, uh, is there a guilt feeling there? Do they, are they struggling? But in fact, as you, if you've heard the guests last couple of weeks, that often the thread through their journeys is a seeking a real relationship with God. Sometimes they're coming from an area like Gary where he had believed there was no God, but then as he interpreted the trajectory of that, really didn't like where that was heading, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean there was another. But yet at the core of his being was the recognition that there was another. Last week when we had the convert from the Baptist to the Mormon faith to the Catholic Church, it's that same search for the real, for the true God. And as St. Augustine says, that that idea is planted within our heart. There's that aching, that restlessness, as St. Augustine says, until we find Jesus, until he makes his home within our heart. And my prayer for any of you watching, if you're searching, if you're seeking, uh, be careful of all those myriad of voices that are out there, that are trying to g gain your attention, to pull your heart. Listen to the church that Jesus gave us. He promised his apostles he would plant a church he would send the Spirit to guide them into all church, into all truth. That is the church. And I would encourage you to listen to the church and pray that the Lord would open your heart to the beauty of this wonderful church He has given us. Well, thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. I'll see you again next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.